We asked you to tell us what's left you feeling ripped off, and you contacted us in your thousands. You've told us about the companies you think get it wrong, and the customer service that simply is not up to scratch. Now I want them to help me, but they're not. They're just passing us from pillar to post. You've asked us to track down the scammers who stole your money and investigate the extra charges you say are unfair. You're just another number, and they just want you in and out as quickly as possible. And when you've lost out but nobody else is to blame, you've come to us to stop others falling into the same trap. As a consumer, if I don't have a choice what I want to do, I don't go to that place anymore. So whether it's a blatant rip-off or a genuine mistake, we're here to find out why you're out of pocket and what you can do about it. Your stories, your money. This is Rip Off Britain. Well, a very good morning to you from all of us, and we're so glad that you've been able to join us for Rip Off Britain live, of course, every morning this week, which means that we can get to grips with all your consumer troubles right here on the spot. And goodness me, your comments have been fabulous, and they've also been coming in <laughs> thick and fast since yesterday's programme with one story in particular really striking a chord. The scam calls which are sweeping the nation, claiming to be from Amazon Prime. That's a big one, isn't it? Yeah, well, as we reveal, they're actually from fraudsters out to steal your money. And guess what? Lots of you actually received that exact same school call after we went off air. Well, we're going to have more on that later. And we'll also be exposing another scam today, this one targeting your mobile. But the people that we've been speaking to say that having their phone account hacked and their bank account defrauded turned out to be just the start of their problems. It took me three phone calls and nearly ripping my hair out to actually get through to a point where somebody would actually have this conversation with me. And as you'll see, I think what's most shocking about that one is just how little help those people say they then got from their mobile network when trouble actually struck. Now, it's really worrying, that story. Plus, the supermarket Morrison's loyalty scheme. Now, it's meant to reward you. So why do you get the blame if your points are stolen and spent by somebody else? Well, that's another big question unfair. today. Absolutely <laughs> unfair. Oh, and as ever, we'll be catching up with our experts. Now, today is personal finance whiz Anita Shah and swooping in for the first time this week, the lesser spotted legal eagle Gary Rykoff. So do please send your questions for them to ripoffbritain at bbc.co.uk or we're on Facebook or as I always say, we're everywhere. <laughs> But first, you would hope that stories about washing machines or tumble dryers catching on fire would be a thing of the past. But as a massive product recall is currently showing, it seems faulty appliances are as big an issue now as ever. It was just a usual Saturday afternoon, sat down watching TV. I was actually in the kitchen preparing lunch. The children were playing and I heard the machine alarm and then I heard Jessica, my daughter, shout that she could smell smoke. For Jason and Claire Honey and their three children, something almost unthinkable was unfolding. So I come running in, looked in the utility room and that had filled up with smoke as well. And there was um, flames coming out of the top of the washing machine. The machine was bleeping um, and there was all smoke coming out of the top of it and it's all black and charred. Really, really scary. Terrified that the fire would spread through the house, quick thinking Jason managed to put it out using damp cloths, but the whole family was left feeling thoroughly shaken. You just don't want to think about the consequences of what could have happened. Had we been out, had we been asleep? It really, you know, it doesn't bear thinking about. But what Jason and Claire didn't know at the time is that their fire was one of 79 similar incidents across the country affecting several models of Hotpoint and Indesit washing machines. We bought Hotpoint because it's a brand that's been about, seems like forever, you know, it's a trusted name. But just three days after Jason and Claire's fire came news that would severely damage the trust that they and other customers had in that brand. Hotpoint's parent company, Whirlpool, announced that it was recalling more than half a million washing machines made between 2014 and 2018 because their door locking mechanism could overheat and catch fire. Jason and Claire now realized they'd been using a potentially unsafe machine almost daily for the last five years. 
having dangerous products in your home and actually not knowing about it is a real, real concern. It does make you wonder how many machines are out there that could just set light without any, any sign or notice of anything happening. Well, by some estimates, as many as one in every 60 homes could have one of the affected machines, which has left thousands of families in limbo. Jason and Claire waited three weeks just for Whirlpool to send an engineer to condemn their machine, and it's taking the company even longer to deliver a replacement, which is becoming a real problem for a family of five. We've waited nearly a month now for a washing machine. This is my main pile of washing at the moment. There are piles around the house. It's been so stressful not having a washing machine. You don't realise how much you depend on one. What we've had to go through to get to where we are now has been, has been dreadful because we, as the customer, shouldn't be the ones chasing. But it's not just the lack of contact which is upsetting customers, because this isn't the first high-profile recall by Hotpoint's parent company, Whirlpool. The government is to order the recall of up to half a million Whirlpool tumble dryers, which pose a fire risk. The government has blamed it for at least 750 fires over an 11-year period. The decision comes four years after Whirlpool issued a warning that its dryers under the Hotpoint, Creda and Indesit brands had a fault which needed repairing. That now notorious fault was at first thought to involve some three and a half million dryers, though it later emerged that as many as five million were affected in total. Whirlpool had been repairing or replacing them since 2015, while telling customers they were safe to use as long as they weren't left unattended. But the number of serious incidents kept on rising, until ministers forced the company finally to recall all defective machines which still remained in people's homes. And while it has acted more quickly to recall affected washing machines, some of the advice it's giving to owners is again causing concern, because many have been told that they can still use their appliances on low temperature cycles. The London Fire Brigade is just one of the organisations who says this approach isn't just confusing, but potentially extremely dangerous. That's not advice that we can endorse. Please do not use your washing machine if it is subject to a recall. Quite simply, if there's a risk of fire, don't use it. One in 60 homes could have one of these affected machines. Any fire could take hold and endanger not just the people nearby, but neighbours and other people in our communities. That's why we're really concerned. Since 2004, Whirlpool machines have been linked to over 800 fires in the UK, and all in all, the company has recalled around 5.5 million washing machines and dryers. But it's by no means the only manufacturer linked to such incidents. In fact, whoever's made them, faulty domestic appliances are one of the most common causes of fire in the UK, as the London Fire Brigade sees on a daily basis. In London, we've seen as many as one fire a day caused by white goods, and because quite often there's lots of plastic in their construction or insulating materials. White goods can cause really devastating fires. People could lose their lives through that fire. And for us, that's a real concern because this is something that we should be able to prevent. But being a fire risk is just one of the factors that might prompt a safety recall. Every week, dozens of warnings are issued on everything from gadgets to cosmetics and food to fashion, all of which might lead you to ask how on earth in 2020 there can be so many dangerous products on the market when you think that with all the knowledge and experience that manufacturers now have, their products would be safer than ever. And that's something that also frustrates the chief executive of the Trading Standards Institute, Leon Livermore. When you look at unsafe goods that actually make it onto the marketplace, I think, I think there's yeah, a couple of, of main drivers. One will be those companies who simply don't care. The corners they cut will mean that actually the, the manufacturing process is not rigorous enough to make sure that that product's safe. That's a very small percentage, by the way. The other area is companies that just produce a huge variety of goods, and you are going to have unsafe products that will get through the net. So that's where it's really important at those stage, those companies have proper testing regimes and respond appropriately. But Leon believes that's not what happened with Whirlpool's 5 million potentially faulty tumble dryers, which took years to be formally recalled. The bottom line is there should have been clearer communications with consumers and, and a much earlier decision to recall. They should have acted quicker. They should not have left unsafe products in consumers' homes.
morally, I think they had a, had a duty to protect consumers much better. But it's not just manufacturers who have a duty to protect consumers. There's a regulator too. It's called the Office for Product Safety and Standards, or OPS for short. It opened its doors two years ago this month, responsible for the safety of almost everything on sale in the UK apart from food, and that includes policing recalls. But even before OPS could mark its second birthday, it's been called toothless, underfunded, and faced criticism over the Whirlpool recall. And Rachel Reeves, MP, former chair of the Common Select Committee for Business, says it's simply not fit for purpose. We urge the government to replace the Office of Product Safety and Standards with a proper regulator, properly independent of government, to ensure the safety of the goods that we have in our homes. It needs the powers and the independence to really take on these companies that are using goods that they know are dangerous. But whether OPS is scrapped or simply overhauled, Jason and Claire are in no doubt that some kind of action is urgently needed to restore their faith in the everyday products whose safety we should all be able to take for granted. You would think if you buy it brand new, it would be good to use and it's not going to be a danger to you or your family. We've got a product in our house that's not fit for purpose and, and, and could have potentially killed someone. There's a lot of really worrying stuff in that report, totally, Glenn, isn't going there? on for ages as yeah. well. Well, that government office, Ops, told us that its priority is to keep people safe and that Britain's product safety standards are some of the highest in the world. Well, since it was set up, Ops has overseen 70 recalls and says that that alone demonstrates that it is carrying out its remit in a robust and effective manner. Ops also told us that after intervening last year to extend Whirlpool's tumble dryer recall, it will closely monitor the company to ensure its washing machine recall is carried out successfully, and rightly so. Yeah, meanwhile, Whirlpool has made the point of saying that uh, the recalled washing machines and dryers were all designed by Indesit long before Whirlpool acquired the group in 2014. And in fact, it was its own team that spotted this latest fault. It says that it has a rigorous commitment to safety and quality, and it'll do whatever it takes to put things right. And many people, of course, are extremely worried. But the company also told us that so far, more than 1.6 million people have checked the recall site and 75,000 out of that, uh, 75,000 affected appliances that is, have been identified, owners of which should receive repairs or replacements within weeks. And Jason and Claire, whom we saw in the film, mm. have now had theirs. Whirlpool also explained that while it does advise people not to use any of its affected machines, the reason that it says the cycle, the reason is they say that it, the cycle will work at 20 degrees or below and they are safe. And that's because the fault itself is not triggered in those cold cycles. And they admit some people will insist on carrying on using their washing it machines. It wouldn't be me in that case. But as for their tumble dryers, Whirlpool says more than half of those affected have been repaired or replaced, mm. which is a much higher than average success rate for a recall. But it urges anyone who might still have either of the affected appliances to get in touch immediately on 0800 316 1442. So that's the number to call. Well, with me now is someone who, when it comes to product safety recalls, literally wrote the book on it, uh, journalist and consumer champion Lynn Foldswood. Lynn, um, we saw some really terrible stories in that film. Uh, um, Whirlpool are now busy with the second recall. How do you think they're handling it? Well, I think they've handled them all rather badly. You know, I used to... When I did Watchdog all those donkeys years ago in programmes like yours, the manufacturers used to come to us and say, please, will you help us? We need to do a recall. Now I think they, they try not to involve the media, which is a major mistake. And this latest recall, the first of all, I couldn't get through to the website at all when they launched it. And they had known for a couple of months they had to do it, so they could have got the website right. And then they put out a phone number for people to ring that actually cost people a lot of money. So people People were telling me they'd had to ring it time and time again and it cost them £15, £7, £20 and it's actually against the law to have a complaint line that makes someone money. 
Now, I know that a few years ago you carried out a report actually at the behest of the government into all this. What's happened to that? Well, that was an independent review which came up with really simple guidance, like there should be a centre that handles product safety, like we have with the Independent Food Standards Agency. So the food's all done independently, backed by government, and that's what I wanted for all other unsafe goods, including all these washing machines and tumble dryers. What's happened? It was launched four years ago nearly, and I just feel it's kept on being kicked a bit down the road and a bit done. And I'm also critical, I'm afraid, of the Office of Product Safety and Standards. I mean, do you think there was a, a reason behind why it hasn't been acted on? Well, um, when it was first, um, I was asked to do it, it was the um, a coalition government that asked mm. me. And then when the next government came in and I handed in the report, the Minister for Business, uh, first of all, she didn't know why I was sitting in their office, having done all this work. Um, and then she said, uh, when we uh, next met her, well, we're just going to hand over to business. So there was no interest really in doing it then. And I just mm. feel it's all been kicked down the road and done in an unsatisfactory way that doesn't help people. Well, then, very depressing for you and uh, <laughs> serious consequences for people. So thank you very much anyway for thank coming you. in. Thank you. Well, I must say, it's an ongoing issue. And, of course, many thanks for all the message that you sent to the programme, particularly after yesterday's programme, with the huge response in particular to our story about Boots the mm -hmm. Chemist starting to charge to deliver medication to people that really need it. Dear patient, we are introducing a delivery charge from the 30th of September 2019. I mean, £55 a year is an awful lot of money. I think it's disgusting. And she's got a point, hasn't she? Yes. And not surprisingly, lots of you found that basically unfair. The thing that really stuck in your throats, though, the most, was the fact that customers who order online can still get their medication delivered for free. Elaine Bennett said, why should those of us who will not be bullied into doing everything over the internet be penalised? have to say I agree with you, Elaine. Meanwhile, Anne and Keith both emailed to say that although they tried ordering online, Boots online servers won't deliver their particular medication. So they're either forced to pay £55 a year for home deliveries from their local branch or find another chemist altogether. Also yesterday, we featured the scammers who are posing as internet giant Amazon and convincing people to download a piece of software that led the fraudsters remotely able to control their computers. Why did I do it? I mean, there's so many warnings about scams. But I suppose it's just the fact that I did have Amazon Prime. It's reeled me in. Dozens of you said that you've had the same calls and emails, almost all of them, trying to convince you to download that Team Viewer software. But Alan Vaughan and Stuart Mutter both emailed to say it's not just that particular software used in these particular scams. The fraudsters who called them mentioned different programmes altogether. And fortunately, both of them hung up before being talked into something that they would regret. And that is exactly what you should do if you get a call out of the blue from someone asking you to download any app like that. And that's a message that we're constantly giving on this programme, isn't it? The thing is, we do, we do the scam live and people are actually involved in it as we're speaking. Yeah. But anyway, well, I'm afraid we've heard about more people who did end up losing their savings. And while under the new rules we've talked about uh, before, most of them have been able to get their money back through their bank. But it still means that the fraudsters have been able to get away with hundreds of pounds of other people's money. Well, later we're going to be hearing from fraud prevention experts to find out exactly what is being done to try and stop the crooks in their tracks. But first, if you are unfortunate enough to be scammed through no fault of your own, well, you might expect the companies affected to bend over backwards to help you out. Totally. But we've been hearing about one mobile phone network whose customer service fell seriously short when you say it was needed most. I think it was the closest to a complete panic attack I've ever had. It was hyperventilating. It was just terrifying, just completely terrifying. One morning last month, Nicole Crawford from Manchester discovered that her phone was being used against her in an elaborate scam. Your phone just becomes kind of an extension of, of you. The fact that someone has access to all of that just makes me feel sick. It all started when Nicole's bank sent her a series of text messages asking her to approve transactions that she knew nothing about. 
I woke up to about six texts from my bank with my one-time password. I was like, it's a bit odd. But before she'd had time to investigate, Nicole spotted something else that rang alarm bells. A string of notifications from Airbnb, delivering the devastating news that, without her knowledge, her account had been used to book four separate hotel stays in London that night. The Airbnb notifications was when I definitely knew something was wrong because I didn't book them. You can't kind of accidentally book an Airbnb. As if all of that wasn't worrying enough, her phone suddenly lost all signal. Tried to text someone and realised that I didn't have any signal anymore. So panicked a little bit. Well, panicked a lot um, because I couldn't figure out what had caused it. Unable to call her phone company three, Nicole went to their nearest shop, hoping to get everything sorted out. But instead, things only got more baffling. Three informed me that I'd closed my account down and there was nothing they could do. She was told that she had personally authorised another phone network to take over her number using something called a PAC code, which is what the industry uses to transfer a mobile phone number from one account to another. They then told me, you requested a PAC code, and I said, no, I didn't. But with Nicole's mobile number now switched to a different network, three seemed unable to help. So next, Nicole contacted her bank to get to the bottom of the mysterious text messages that she'd received, detailing transactions that she knew nothing about. We talked through some of the transactions and I was like, that wasn't me. And so he phoned the fraud team and the fraud team were the ones who told us that it was um, a SIM card swap. Finally, Nicole had an explanation. She'd been targeted by what's called SIM swap fraud, which means a criminal posing as her had convinced her phone company, Three, that she wanted to change mobile provider and take her number with her. What's more, once they'd got control of her phone, they were able to use other details that they'd somehow managed to get hold of to try and transfer money out of her online bank account. Thankfully, the bank realised something wasn't right and stopped the transactions. But with full access to her mobile, the scammers next turned their attention to Nicole's social media accounts and email. Completely panicked at that point. Um, phone my manager in floods of tears because that email address is it got everything on it. I've had it since I was about 12. They have managed to access Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, then Airbnb. You just feel really furious that somebody has the sheer cheek to do this and just really unsafe. Over the next few days, Nicole frantically tried to get back control of her phone and her life from the scammers. But while her bank quickly froze her accounts, phone company three didn't seem to be taking the fraud quite as seriously. Told them that the bank had told me it was SIM swap fraud and they wouldn't even let me speak to their customer service complaints or fraud team to actually get them to acknowledge that this was SIM swap fraud, that it is their responsibility to fix it. It's been like bashing my head off a brick wall. Finally, 72 hours after all of this began, Nicole got through to Three's fraud team. They told her that the day before she was hacked, they had sent a text advising her that a new PAC code had been requested. But as she'd never asked for one, Nicole had assumed that the message wasn't important. And while in that same call to the company's fraud team, she'd asked them to reopen her account and get her number back, she was still waiting for either of those things to happen when we filmed with her more than a week later. Even worse, her bank had frozen her account while it investigated the attempted fraud. So as well as having no access to her phone, she can't get hold of her money either. We had a, a money box that every so often we'd put change into and we went and made a, a six pound food shop of stuff that's gonna last you a while. I've got no finances, no email address, very little social media. Do I think three have been helpful? In a word, no. 
SIM swap fraud is on the rise, with action fraud receiving more than double the number of cases last year than it did in 2017. So you'd expect the mobile phone networks to be doing all that they can to support customers whose lives have been thrown into chaos. But Nicole is not the only person who says they've been let down by the way that three responded after they'd been SIM swapped. When Gemma Curtis received a text from Three about a request to close her account and send a PAC code, she told them it was an error. But they still let the number fall into the scammer's hands and charged her for the privilege. I found a letter from Three um, having charged me over £100 for cancelling my contract early. So obviously, you know, pretty angry about that because I hadn't cancelled my contract. They were aware it was fraud because I'd been reporting it to them every day. Meanwhile, the fraudsters had used her number to steal £8,000 from her bank account and take out a loan for £30,000. But still, Three was no help in blocking the fraudsters' access to her account. I couldn't even raise a complaint because they said to me, uh, you can't raise a complaint until your service is restored. In the end, it actually took them six weeks to respond. That's six weeks of three knowing that Gemma had been a victim of fraud and doing nothing about it. And Sanj Sanghera experienced something similar, having to wait a fortnight for Three's fraud team to take action when he'd been targeted by a similar scam. The fraudster who had my phone number would have intercepted all text messages and phone calls that were directed to me. I felt that Three should have cancelled my number from, 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 from the get-go but they seemingly didn't take my case seriously at all. We've heard from others in the same situation. None of them had a clue what SIM swapping was or how powerful their phone number could be in the hands of a fraudster. But as their phone company is aware of both of those things, they all think three should have done much more to help. And with her situation still unresolved, Nicole is desperate for some help. Hi. It's really nice to meet you. So we brought her along to meet cybersecurity expert Scott McGreedy to try to help her understand what's gone on. But first, he wants to check the most crucial thing. Could the scammers still be using Nicole's phone number? How long have three had your case for now? Nine days from the first time I phoned them from when my account cut off. So they've been on it for nine days. Do you want to give it a ring? and see if anybody picks if, up. If someone, yeah, if sure, alive. why not? Let's see if someone picks up. Sure. OK. This is really nerve-wracking. More than a week after Nicole told Three that a scammer had transferred her number over to a new network, GifGaff, she's hoping that's now been put right. Welcome to GifGaff's voicemail. The person you're calling can't take your call at the moment. Please leave your message after the tone. Leave a message? Essentially, it, it, that phone number belongs to me, but as far as GifGaff are concerned, it's kind of been legitimately transferred over. I would genuinely recommend phoning the new provider and saying, look, just to let you know this, is, this has happened. It's... Would they be allowed to talk to me, though? That's a, another good question. <laughs> um, okay. They might not be able to tell you anything about the account, but <laughs> it's one of the things I would definitely recommend to phone them. You will feel a bit powerless, but don't stop. But getting her number back isn't the only thing on Nicole's mind. She's locked out of almost all her online accounts, and she's worried about what purpose they might be used for next. I could have understood, like, Monzo, Pay, PayPal and TSB, but it's the fact that, like, Snapchat, what are you going to do with my Snapchat? What they could do there is they could use that to try and uh, defraud some of your friends as you, so they could pretend to be you, send <laughs> malicious links and try and get yeah. people in. But it's not to say that they will go and try and defraud your friends straight away, mm. but it's always better for a fraudster to get more information and do nothing with it than to get less information and wish that they got more. Nicole had no idea how much havoc could be caused with her phone number, but she's in no doubt that her phone company, Three, should have known that, and that it had a responsibility to act much more quickly once she'd said what was going on. What should they have done? You've put your faith in the company, and they have a duty of care yeah. for you. They should have recognised, hey, customer did not request a PAC code. 
but there's one that's been sent out. Yeah. This must be SIM swap, or it could potentially be SIM swap. Let's treat it as such until we know otherwise. It took me three phone calls and nearly ripping my hair out to actually get through to a point where somebody would actually have this conversation with me. There's some really jaw-dropping stuff in that mm, film, isn't terrible. there? Well, as you can guess, lots of you are already messaging us about that film. And Three says that it recognises that really it should have done a lot more to return those phone numbers in a timely manner. It has apologised to Nicole, Gemma and Sanj, admitting that the service that they received was not up to the company's usual standards. Three pointed out that fraudsters tend to have already collected a lot of personal information on their targets before they try to take control of their phone numbers, going on to say that in Nicole's case, the fraud on her bank account had taken place before Three was informed of any sort of problem. But of course that was actually before Nicole had any idea of what was happening, <laughs> which is why as a result of all of this, Free is now introducing new procedures to help customers when they've been a victim of SIM swap fraud. And they brought in enhanced ID checks for anyone who's attempting to get a new SIM card. And I have to say, that's a great result for the effect that Rip Off Britain has on these stories. Yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, GIFGAF, the company to which Nicole and Gemma's numbers were transferred, told us it allowed their numbers to be returned to Three as soon as it was told they'd been switched fraudulently. Now, with me in the studio is Nick Downing from fraud prevention service Cyphus. So I, I was disturbed by all the cases in that particular film. It's a fairly new scam as far as I'm concerned. How big a scam is it generally throughout the country? So it's really growing at the moment. Telecoms fraud in general is, is growing according to, to Cyphus data. So we're now looking at about a 35% increase on telephone account takeover. 35 as a high percentage. Yeah, very much so. And, and what's the percentage of growth on identity fraud generally? So in the last year, 25%, 169,000 cases of identity fraud. And to be quite honest, I think that's the tip of the iceberg. But more people are reporting, which is good. But never be embarrassed about reporting. Report to your bank, report to action fraud. It's so important. And here we are, fairly well at the beginning of a new year. What are the frauds that we all should be looking out for in particular? So um, not much is changing. It's just the, the, the type or the, um, the, the product they're looking. So you've talked well, about I Amazon I always think fraud. the fraudsters are ahead of the game. They, they, as soon as one finishes, another one is in the pipeline. So what do you know of that, that we should look for? Right. So the, the one that seems to be really prominent is courier fraud. So when someone says they have police, HMRC, from a company in authority, and they want your bank details, your, your, your passcode, etc. That well, is see, really common. You might say generally, well, why would people do that? But they try to trick you into the fact that you're helping the police solve the case, don't they? Ab ab absolutely. And someone from authority, the police, coming to you to say that, you're going to give it. Police will never, ever do, do that. that. You know, anyone who calls, cold calls you unsolicited, put the phone down, take five, research them. That's so important. But, but you see, loneliness in that case actually is another problem because people will be sucked in by very yeah. clever people. I want to talk also about account takeover because that happened to me a couple of years ago. My bank gave my, gave my account to four total strangers now i can I, I still don't understand that yeah and i do think that the banks have to be very sure that they are doing the correct security checks so obviously all, all cases different my, my advice will always be go to your bank if you think you're a victim of fraud go to your bank straight away report it to action fraud never be embarrassed please please report it yes but you see what i'm saying that is not that if your account is taken over the checks it's all very well for me to be careful but the banks also have to be careful that they are doing the checks in the case of fraudsters coming in like my case strangers a absolutely so the checks that the banks are doing that we must keep our private data private is really really important let's not give the fraudsters that opportunity and what are you doing as an organization to try and get on top of it all so what we're looking now actually what all the current themes are we're going to share that we're going to do more awareness raising it's so important our consumers and our members at cyfas are aware of what the current trends are so we can be ahead of the game rather than one step behind so you'll come to programs like this all the time absolutely <laughs> if, if uh, invited thank you well you are thank you very much indeed nick well, time for us now to have a look at what's making the headlines in today's papers. And following that story that we just saw there about three this morning, the network comes in for even more stick in several of the papers today. Phone firm 
three is criticized for penalizing loyal customers, says The Telegraph. And this is the issue of loyalty penalties, when a customer that uh, sticks with the company ends up paying more for contracts than those that switch providers. Old story, that really, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, the competition watchdog singled out the firm as part of its look at several markets, including insurance, savings and broadband. Three and other bodies blamed slow progress from the regulators. Meanwhile, the railways are in the news again this morning, um, possibly accompanied by cheers from disgruntled commuters. Network rail bosses face losing bonuses over delays, according to an article in The Times. This is the news that the company has been reprimanded for poor punctuality and delays on busy commuter lines. Network Rail's boss has apologised, according to the paper, and admitted that passengers have been coping with very poor train services for far too long. Something we've been arguing about on this programme. Uh, but I think perhaps we all need to wise up a bit as consumers, apparently, because the Mail is reporting that one in 20 Britons think that potatoes grow on trees. And that's according to a poll of some 2,000 shoppers. They obviously never watch gardeners' world, do they? <laughs> well, someone who knows exactly where her fruit and veg comes from is Gloria, who's over with our experts ready to tackle more of your problems. Gloria. Well, I'd have to say modestly, I do know my onions. Now, in our advice clinic today, we have Phil Summers, and Phil comes from Birmingham, so he's made that trip to be with us, and he's here to see our consumer lawyer, Gary Rykoff, about a problem that he and several other viewers have told us about, that they're having with Morrison's Moore. It's a loyalty scheme, and I also want to say that Anita Shaw, our finance, uh, personal finance expert, is here as well. But first of all, to your case, thank you very much. So you, you have this loyalty scheme. How many points had you built up? I'd had 87,000 points, which equates to more or less £90, 90 pounds, uh, just before Christmas. And you didn't get to spend it at Christmas? I didn't, know. Just before Christmas, Morrison sent me uh, an email saying that I got these £90 pounds to spend. When I checked the app, the very next day, unfortunately, they'd all been spent, but not by myself. So somebody else just stole them? They'd had, yes. Basically? Yeah. Yep. Miffed, I should imagine you <laughs> yes, were? Yes, yes. Gary, you've been in touch with Morrison's. What did they have to say? Most say that while they're very sorry about what's happened, they say that the issue is because people like Phil use the same passwords on different websites. Hackers get into those passwords, sell them to scammers, and then scammers use them to access people's point system. They say because the correct login was used on Phil's account, they don't see an issue, and they're adamant that there hasn't been a data breach at their end. So it's a blank no. A no from Morrison. Which I think actually is very, very bad customer service, which really, in a way, is the only thing we can depend on these mm. days. Absolutely, Do you yes. feel like that? Yeah, I do, yes, yes, definitely. Anything that, that we can do about this? Well, from a legal point of view, I have looked at the Morrison's terms and conditions, and they've got it pretty much sewn up, because they actually say that Morrison's themselves own the points. So even if you said to Morrison's, it wasn't me that used the points, they'd say, well, it doesn't really matter because the points belong to us and not y you. Yeah. It's only at the point of conversion that they become valuable to you. Um, Any action you can take? I think the issue is the data here. This is a loyalty scheme. You've given Morrison's information about you, sensitive information about you, and the way they've handled it is, is, is the key issue. Yeah. So ask them, why has your information gone astray? If you're not satisfied with the answer, you can go to the Information Commissioner's Office and they can investigate. But as you say, Gloria, this is a loyalty scheme. Loyalty is the key word. Where's the loyalty? I don't see it anywhere. <laughs> so you do that, Phil. Go I for it. Will. Yeah. Yes, and I would worry about where I'd buy my chicken in the future, personally, <laughs> but there you go. Now, we have, of course, Anita with us here. So, Anita, as from April, uh, the, the rates in terms of overdraft is going to change. So explain how that's going to work. Absolutely. So instead of having um, fees and charges for your going into an overdraft, you will just have one uh, simple interest calculation. So it's the APR that we commonly see on our credit cards. Do you mean right across the board? Absolutely, Whatever size yes. your overdraft is? Exactly. So banks are required to, some have already announced, in fact, uh, the rate that they're going to be uh, commencing from the 1st of April. Some have even started implementing it already. Because the big question is, um, if it's going to be right across the board, is that good or bad news for us, the customer? Well, it very much depends on how much you use your overdraft. So if you are an infrequent user of your overdraft and it's a small amount, then currently you would be hit by a lot of fees and charges. You'll now benefit from having just one interest rate. So the fee will go? Absolutely, yeah. Um, if you are a more regular user of your overdraft, it's maybe a higher amount for a longer period, then that interest rate is going to hurt because, of course, it's being announced at the moment up to and around 40%. 40%? Yeah. You're kidding. I'm not. Right across the board? Yeah. 
So not everybody has announced, but for those who have announced, the banks who have announced, oh, it is coming out of that one bank. does it, the rest of it. And just very quickly, you were scammed as well out of your so-called loyalty points. I was indeed, yes. I was crushed. If it can happen to Anita, it can happen to any of us. So there you go. Thank you all very much indeed. And now, of course, with some big news on an undercover investigation that we ran a few series back. Back in October 2017, we heard from a string of viewers very unhappy with Britain's biggest electrical retailer, Curry's PC World. Farah, Peter, Kayleigh and Sean were just a handful of them. They'd all paid extra for extended warranties on products that they'd bought from the shop, after advice from Curry staff, only to put in a claim and find that they weren't covered. Hassle-free cover, that's what I thought, but unfortunately it didn't turn out to be like that. So we wanted to see for ourselves how staff at Curry's PC World sold those extended warranties. And we were shocked at the results. I'm good, do you work here? In nine of the 10 stores, our secret shoppers were given incorrect information. And there was one word that kept cropping up about what the extended warranty covered. So this covers everything? Everything. Everything, everything really? Unfortunately, that just wasn't true. At the time, Curry's PC World told us it was disappointed with what we'd found, which was not in line with its staff training. Well, almost two years after our investigation, the way some Curry staff sell extended warranties came in for more scrutiny, this time from the Competition and Markets Authority, which conducted its own mystery shopping investigation and found that staff were giving the wrong advice on warranties in a quarter of cases. Last November, the CMA announced it had been working with Curry's to help it introduce sweeping changes, including retraining staff and putting posters and leaflets in store so that customers can see easily what is covered and what's not. Hopefully, this will put an end to misleading warranty sales. Of course, if it doesn't, we'll be very quick to send our secret shoppers out once more. Well, that's almost it from us, but uh, actually we've got enough time to ask our experts some of the questions that uh, you've been sending in while we've been on the air. And uh, Gary, this one's for you. Andrew in Blantyre in Scotland says his driving licence and passport have both expired, but his bank has asked him to bring them in to withdraw money from his savings. And he wants to know, can they accept expired ID after all the picture and his personal details are still him? Yeah, well, under the money laundering regulations 2007, businesses like banks have to confirm who their customers are. They have to confirm their name and their address. Different banks have different rules, so if his bank says that an out-of-date passport and driving licence are not acceptable, he'll have to go along with that. But the government do have other ideas about the ID you can use. You can use your original birth certificate, you can use one of those old-style full driving licences, you can use a shotgun certificate, so he might have something else uh, <laughs> that, that he can take into the bank. <laughs> Give me the money. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Now, a question for Anita this time, and Brenda, thank you very much for sending your email. She says that last September she cancelled a subscription to an online service and has the email from them to actually confirm it. But they're still charging her debit card for the subscription every single month, even though she calls them each time to complain. Now, her question is, if the company isn't getting the message, can't she ask her bank just to not let them take the money out again? Yeah, absolutely she can. She should go to the bank, explain the situation, get them to stop the payments, also talk to the bank about how she recovers the payments that have already been made, and she should invoke that provider's a complaints process and submit a written complaint. Yeah, that's a really important thing, to get the previous money back, of Absolutely. Course, yeah. Gary, one for you. Richard on email says he bought a brand new motorcycle, but within five days it had developed faults. He asked the retailer for a refund, but they refused, so he got an independent assessor, clever man, to check the bike out. They agreed it was faulty, but still no refund from the retailer. What can you do? I think Richard has a future as a lawyer because he's done everything correctly. <laughs> you know, he knows his rights. Under the Consumer Rights Act, you can, re you can turn back goods within 30 days. He did it within five days, so they should give him a refund. He's got an independent report now. He's got all the makings of a, of a legal case. He needs to get on and sue them. Brilliant. Now, lots of you who wanted to get in touch about the telephone number for Whirlpool. This is really important for you if you've got a query for Whirlpool because the number again is here on the screen. It's 0800 316 1442. It it's a free phone number now, which means unlike when Lynn was talking to us, she said it was going to cost you money, you, yeah. you can now actually get it absolutely 
free. Well, I'm afraid um, that that's just about where we're going to have to leave it for today. Thanks for all of the comments you've sent us. I'm sorry we actually haven't had time to get them all in, but we've had loads. <laughs> but we will be back again in your corner to do it all again tomorrow. So <laughs> until then, from all of us, it's goodbye. But get in touch with us again. And have a good afternoon. Bye-bye. <laughs>